Thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, immigration update, specifically focused uh, on things that are going on at universities, points of interest for universities. Uh, my name is Tom Brett Young. I'm a partner at VWV and I head up the uh, immigration team where we provide advice to uh, employers, education providers uh, on uh, all aspects of uh, UK immigration. And with that fairly broad focus, you can imagine that uh, universities are a key sector for us. So very nice to be talking to you uh, this morning. Well, we have a fairly packed agenda following some uh, recent uh, amendments to the uh, immigration rules and sponsorship guidance. So uh, this is broadly what we're going to be covering this morning. Uh, we'll, well, actually, before the agenda, actually, I'll, I'll give you a little update on what's happening with the uh, UK immigration system as a, as a whole. We'll then look particularly at uh, student visas, sponsorship compliance on the uh, student side of things. We'll then look at uh, immigration routes for workers and what's, what, what changes have happened there. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about ATAS, the Academic Technology Approval Scheme, we have updates on, on what's happening there. And then to round off, we'll look at what's on the horizon, things that we're expecting to happen over the next 12 months uh, or so. Um, before we get into all of that, always find it really helpful to know uh, who's, who's attending, particularly when I'm speaking to universities, because being such a large organisation, there's a great range of uh, people that we're interested in speaking to. So, yes, if you could let us know uh, whether you're interested primarily in employment immigration issues, student immigration issues, whether you take a more sort of strategic look at things, needs to know everything, or maybe you're just a bit of a bit addicted to webinars and are here for the fun and the, and the, and the jokes. Let's see how we get on. Nobody's here just for the jokes. Everybody's here to get up with some serious work. Uh, so most of you primarily interested in employment and immigration. Um, actually, not, not a huge number interested in the student immigration side of things, but uh, uh, around a third uh, uh, interested in, uh, uh, in, in broad, broadly everything. And as we'll see from the slides, the majority of the updates do actually relate to student immigration, but they do uh, have knock-on effects to uh, uh, employment. So uh, uh, hopefully, but it's something for, for everyone. Right. Oh, did I share the results? No, look, there you go, there's your results. About half of you interested in the employment side of things. Okay. So what's happening as far as uh, uh, visa applications are concerned? Uh, we've got this rather interesting looking graph uh, over the last, uh, which, which is showing uh, development of uh, issue, issuance of visas across all categories um, since 2014, so, so over, the last, over the last 10 years. Uh, big dip uh, in uh, 2020, 2021. Uh, let's not talk about why that was, uh, but now we can see that we're back up to uh, pre-pandemic levels. It's indeed slightly above uh, that position. So this is visas issued, as I say, across, across all categories. Uh, and as we can see from the, 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 the pie chart, the most recent set of figures um, uh, the uh, over half of all these issues were for people visiting the UK. So that's not total number of visitors, that's just anybody who needs a visa to visit the UK. Next largest category, uh, not surprisingly, is people coming for study, people coming for work uh, behind that, uh, and then uh, smaller uh, numbers uh, for uh, family based reasons, and then, and then your catch all of other. Uh, and then specifically looking at student visas that have been granted, again, over that same period, uh, we're still uh, reliant to a large extent on the uh, government's uh, global, uh, uh, the, the international education strategy um, uh, produced in 2019 after, what, how many governments ago? Uh, technically, uh, two governments ago, where they uh, stated their ambition to grow the number of students hosted in the UK to 600,000 per year by 2030. Actually, when you look at these latest figures, we've got almost 500,000 student visas 
being granted uh, uh, to the year ending uh, June 2023. And what's interesting about that is, is that probably means that we've met our target. Um, that probably means that we've met our target. Uh, I can see that some people are having trouble with uh, hearing me. Maybe there's some trouble with my audio. I wonder if I might just unplug my headphones and see if that's any better. I think sometimes I have issues with these headphones. Bear with me. Hope you can hear me a bit better now. Do let me know if you can't hear me at all. Keen, keen eye being kept on the chat. Um, so yes, because this chart, the, the, the bar chart on the right hand side only refers to student visas which are granted and, and that doesn't encompass all of international students because some international students won't need a student visa, they'll have a, a visa in another category or maybe they're British citizens but coming to the UK for the first time or having following a period of residence overseas and technically are considered to be, uh, it would still be classed as international students. So uh, in all probability, best estimates are that actually that uh, target of 600,000 per year has already been met. Hooray, go us. Um, but that doesn't stop uh, people still wanting uh, uh, to, to grow the sector even further. Uh, but also the corollary, corollary of that, I hate that word, uh, is, um, uh, is that it, it, it draws attention to our sector uh, and the number of visas being granted. And for those politicians who shall remain nameless uh, but don't like uh, immigration uh, numbers going up, um, that means that we become a target. Um, just in terms of uh, where those international students are coming from, or, or at least those who need uh, student visas, uh, big news over the last couple of years has, has been India overtaking uh, China. Um, and, you know, actually now the number of Indians being granted student visas, we can see is, is higher than it ever was for those coming from China. India and China still, by far and away, the largest source uh, destination countries uh, for us. And the, the other interesting point I noted just when looking at these figures the other day, uh, in terms of the top five, is that the United States has overtaken Bangladesh, which was in uh, fifth place. That's not, as you can see from the bar chart, the United States increasing in numbers. It's actually the number of Bangladeshis uh, being granted visas falling. So um, uh, there, there's, there's our, our, our top five. Um, and, of course, the concern that we've had uh, around numbers from India increasing is that, generally speaking, uh, UKVI, the Home Office, are, are far more uh, wary of Indians. They, they, they consider there to be a far greater degree of uh, abusive applications by Indian nationals, whereas Chinese nationals were generally seen as more, more compliant. So uh, something we'll come on to uh, as we go through the session will be uh, what we might do in order to uh, 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 you know, ensure compliance and reduce the risks to our sponsor licenses. And then just moving on to trends as far as work visas are concerned. I mean, the, the, the chart on the left-hand side really tells its own story. Uh, there was a sort of gradual growth up until the end of free movement. We had a dip as a result of the pandemic. And then following the end of free movement, well, look look what's happened. We've, we've got what it might look, looks almost like a label, doesn't it? Uh, with the number of work visas uh, skyrocketing uh, and seemingly not. Uh, not debating in terms of the, uh, the, the, the trend there. Um, and uh, we've also got some data from the Home Office, which is quite interesting in terms of showing uh, what categories of worker those uh, work visas are generally applying to. So, so this chart shows the job categories that sponsored workers um, are, are, are coming to fill uh, based on their certificates of sponsorship. Um, huge jump in the number of human health and social work activities. Um, and where the majority of work visas, which have been used for universities, the professional scientific and technical activities, uh, uh, that uh, while those numbers have increased, uh, they're still way, way below those numbers for um, human health. Uh, although looking at things coming close to the number of issues in, uh, in, in IT type uh, occupations. Uh, so an increase for the number of um, people come to do the sort of work that they would be doing at universities, but uh, not nearly as significant as uh, people coming for 
uh, healthcare and social work. So the big uh, news really for uh, the sector as far as uh, immigration was concerned was the uh, announcement uh, from the uh, Secretary of State uh, back in the summer, uh, which really, really pro was prompted by the uh, publication of the, the previous set of uh, immigration statistics, uh, which revealed a very large spike in the, in the net migration numbers and prompted um, uh, some, some reforms, some of which took place immediately, some of which are, are coming to force uh, early next year. And really, as I sort of hinted earlier, the Secretary of State focused her eye on the uh, on, on people coming uh, uh, coming to the UK as students, and in particular their their dependents. Uh, so, so we'll go into the detail shortly, but just just very briefly, um, the uh, Home Secretary and the uh, Minister for Education reaffirmed their commitment to the inter international education strategy, but. Uh, uh, want to make it harder for students to switch into the uh, into work-based routes. They must complete their studies before before doing so. Uh, dependents are now no longer permitted or will no longer be permitted for courses starting after the 1st of January unless the student they are accompanying uh, will be doing a postgraduate research-based uh, degree. Um, there will be a clampdown on unscrupulous international uh, student agents who may be supporting in inappropriate applications. Uh, there's to be a review of the maintenance provisions for students and their dependents. Um, and uh, otherwise, fortunately, something that was of, of quite some concern before the announcement was made, fortunately, the graduate group remains in place. That that isn't being uh, uh, removed or watered down in any way, which was which certainly was a concern uh, within, within the sector. So just trying to sort of keep things demarked Demarked between uh, uh, yeah, those of you from admissions and those of you from 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 HR, just from a, 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 an admissions point of view, um, actually the switch, uh, the restriction on switching um, from student to work route does help us, I think, somewhat. I think there was some concern within the sector that uh, a lot of students were new, or a lot of uh, purported students were coming to the UK, getting their student visa in order to get into the UK and then they weren't actually that interested in studying once they were here. And one of the risks, uh, one of the reasons for that is that um, uh, when you sponsor a, uh, a skilled worker, you have to pay an immigration skills charge, which can be up to £5,000 for the duration of their sponsorship. It's, it's calculated on a uh, on the basis of how many years they'll be here, up to, up to £1,000 a year. Um, and, but there is there's an, there's an exemption if you switch from the student category into a uh, skilled worker. And that exemption applies whether the student has graduated or not. So if we put our um, uh, unscrupulous hats on and we decide to think like bad people, we might say if we were a business and we wanted to recruit people from overseas, but we didn't want to pay the skills charge, we might encourage somebody to apply for a student visa first, get into the UK, not bother taking up a course or drop out after a, a, a few weeks um, and um, and switch into the skilled worker category. And if the amount they lose in terms of their visa application fees and their deposit uh, is less than £5,000, well, we're ahead of the game. So um, uh, uh, that has now been stopped. Um, it, it's, it's no longer possible to switch from the student route to skilled worker uh, unless the student has completed their studies. Um, and that, as I say, and we'll, we'll look at precisely the, the mechanics of how that works when we talk about uh, work-based uh, migration routes uh, a bit later. But uh, certainly from our perspective of, of, of those of us with our uh, compliance hats on, student compliance hats on, uh, those of us interested in the basic compliance assessment who don't want students either not enrolling or not turning up or, or, or dropping out early, um, this this certainly discourages discourages that. Um, so you can only switch to a work route after completing your course, or if you're a PhD student, you can switch after 24 months study. Uh, this doesn't just apply to the skilled work route; it also applies to UK ancestry, global talent, uh, high potential individual, uh, the innovator 
category as well. Um, it doesn't do anything if we're just thinking about the basic compliance assessment and, and, and dropouts and, and non-completion uh, and, and, uh, and non-enrollments. Uh, it doesn't help anyone and it, it helps us with those students who are potentially uh, coming to the UK as a student because that's they want to claim asylum and there's no other way for them to get into the UK, the absence of what the, the government referred to as safe and legal routes. Uh, there are very few of those. Um, or, or indeed those students who were genuine but actually have to drop out because when they get here they realise they can't afford to support themselves. So those are real issues for the sector at the moment uh, um, um, and uh, this change there's nothing nothing around that um, but nevertheless it does potentially rule out or, or help to reduce one one risk that we were uh, that, that, that we were faced with um, as a result of this there has been an update to the uh, sponsor guidance uh, in relation to the reporting of students completing their studies uh, um, uh, not at uh, the same time as their, uh, uh, sorry, completing their studies uh, either before or after the uh, start date, at the, at the end date on their uh, CAS, the confirmation of the acceptance of studies. This, uh, the, the text in black here has been in the sponsor guidance for a while, and, and it says that where a student finishes one or two, two weeks earlier or later than the course start date, uh, then you wouldn't generally need to add uh, to, to, to add a note to the uh, sponsor management system. Uh, but uh, we've now got this addendum to that, which says it may be considered best practice to continue making notifications where the course end date has changed within that student range, because that then informs whether the student is permitted to switch into a work route or not. Um, so that might just be something you need to, those of you responsible for reporting student activity, uh, may just need to think about whether uh, whether or not to report uh, report those things. Um, as to the restriction on dependence, and this is obviously going to have a knock on effect in terms of uh, student recruitment. Lots of students now will not be able to bring their dependents with them, and so probably may decide not to come to the UK in the first place. Uh, this kicks in for courses starting after the first of January. Um, uh, you, students can only be accompanied by dependents if uh, uh, the CAS confirms that the course is a PhD or other doctoral qualification or a research-based higher degree. Uh, that's defined as a postgraduate programme comprising a research component, including a requirement to produce original work that is largely that is larger than any accompanying taught component when measured by student research. That's that. Apparently, I'm no expert on this bit. Uh, uh, that's apparently some uh, accepted definition of postgraduate research degree. It's incorporated now into the immigration rules, um, and is, is what you will have to uh, uh, comply with when deciding whether the course that you're sponsoring someone to do is a research-based course or not. Uh, and again, we've got updates to the sponsor guidance as a result of this change so um for courses at rqf7 or sqf uh, scqf11 if you want in scotland uh you now must indicate on the cas whether the course uh is uh is is uh, uh, research based uh, or not the uh academic course level field on the cas has new options which allow you to, to denote whether it's research or not and um, we've now got this new uh paragraph in the sponsor guidance which says that UKBI will monitor the data on course designations and where they are concerned that you are misstating whether a course is uh, research based or not uh, then they'll liaise with the appropriate regulatory body uh, appropriate regulatory body so presumably the OFS uh, in, in England uh, and the equivalent uh, bodies uh, in, the, in uh, the other nations throughout the UK and there's now a new compliance concern. So in the list of uh, um, uh, issues which might give rise to uh, a compliance action being taken, um, uh, um, then uh, there the, the concern would be uh, a failure to provide a list of all courses currently offered by the sponsor, which are designated as research programmes and or to ensure this list is reviewed and updated 
on a yearly basis. So that's something uh, additional which you're now being required to uh, report on to uh, UKBI. Um, just some other points to uh, flag up uh, in, in relation to the uh, student route. And uh, some of these points uh, come out of um, a, a meeting that I was uh, fortunate to attend uh, in Sheffield at uh, UKVI operations um, alongside some colleagues from the Immigration Law Practitioners Association who we were invited for a meeting to meet with various people on, on the operation side, dealing with, with, with various routes. There were, there were representatives from uh, student uh, sponsor compliance and student visa processing there. Uh, so just some, some little tidbits from that which might be of interest. Um, so they have recruited more compliance officers uh, and are looking to do more uh, 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 compliance visits and you might well have uh, already experienced that and certainly aware of more visits having taken place. So that certainly seems to chime in with what's going on in practice. On the student visa side of things, uh, they uh, have seen an increase in fraudulent documents uh, from some countries. Ghana was named uh, in particular, and in particular they were concerned about the financial documents that were being uh, submitted. Um, they have seen an increase, and, and I, you know, uh, 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 from speaking with various uh, universities, I'm aware of um, uh, students coming to the UK and then claiming asylum, as I mentioned a few moments ago, um, and uh, they they, they, they again named in particular one country, Bangladesh, as one from which um, uh, that seems to be uh, a, a bit of a trend. Um, they did confirm that they would view a student who does that as non-genuine. Um, difficulty, of course, for you is how, how do we establish whether somebody who's applying for a course is going to claim asylum or not? We, we just don't know. And, and some of the questions which you might ask to elicit that information might be seen as, 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 as inappropriate or, or maybe even discriminatory. So do need to be careful about that. And, and maybe it's a case of looking for uh, trends in terms of which agents they've applied through, that, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, that's certainly something to uh, to watch out for because it's something that, that UKVI uh, are picking up on. Also reported as sort of an increase in students being stopped at the border due to English language concerns. Um, so again, uh, making sure that you, you, you've got robust process in place for checking English language as part of your recruitment processes. And then in, in, in terms of agents, and that was again something that was announced by the uh, Secretary of State uh, in, in her announcement back in the summer, in terms of stamping down on unscrupulous agents, UKVI are also, sort of, well, as you would expect, uh, uh, having been, uh, required to do so by the political paymasters uh, are, are also now concerned about um, agents. You should all be reporting the agents that you work with anyway. I understand that um, they've gone through a similar exercise this year with sending out a spreadsheet that they're asking you to complete if they haven't heard from you in terms of the agents that you work with. So if you've received that, uh, uh, crikey, please do complete it and send it back because um, not really any good reason uh, not to. Um, they, uh, in terms of trends, in terms of fraudulent applications, uh, they did report uh, issues around uh, what they see as recycling of funds. So one person applies with the funds, move it to a friend's bank account, 28 days later they apply. Um, <clears throat> they think this actually might be something that, that has been encouraged by, by agents. So again, uh, uh, and we've got some slides on. I've got some slides on agents in, the, in a, a few moments. We'll talk about that a bit more there. Um, and they did raise concerns about some providers being over reliant on a small number of agents. So, so do 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 keep them keep an eye on that. Um, one issue which we raised with them was the issue of students who inadvertently arrive in the UK as visitors, having believed that they've got permission otherwise or uh, arrived too early that 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 uh, before the visa has either taken effect or been 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 granted uh, they're aware that it's quite a common issue um they didn't really give us any uh clear steer on the best way to deal with it in every case but they are actually seeking guidance from policy on on uh, on whether there might be a uh, an acceptable approach uh, that could be adopted uh in in, in all cases where that uh, arises 
couple of things which aren't on the slide that I also wanted to flag with you just while we're talking about these sorts of sorts of issues. Um, what one thing that I'm aware is often asked about in compliance inspections is uh, around uh, uh, the distance that students are living from the university uh, if they're living hundreds of miles away, uh, but a full time student. Um, um, or rather, if your records show that they're living hundreds of miles away and they're a full time student, then UKBI might well ask whether they are genuinely studying, whether they are engaging with their studies. Um, so uh, uh, if it is possible within your systems to do some sort of audits, check that people are within a particular radius of the university, that probably isn't a bad idea because I think that it's something that UKDI is starting to look at. It might be if you're showing uh, an address hundreds of miles away that it's just you haven't updated your systems uh, or updated your records. Um, uh, or they've provided a, 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 an incorrect address, in which case that needs to be corrected. That that would be the, the, the approach there. Um, the, the other thing I just wanted to mention, and this applies both on the work side and also the student side, is, is there was an update on the sponsor management system a couple of days ago, um, asking sponsors uh, to ensure that authorising officers and key contacts, uh, national insurance numbers are uh, added on the system. So um that's something that uh, you, should, you should you should take a look at um in addition to which they also want you to provide your um uh, uh company's house reference number uh, now some of you might be from universities which don't have a company's house reference number in which case you can't provide one but if you're a royal charter university for example then there might be a royal charter example which is on company's house uh and you could you can certainly add to that um so that would be something to take away and, and, and have a look at. And if anybody's got any questions about that, do let us know. The, the reason for those uh, uh, those requests, we think it probably isn't one that's going to particularly impact the sector. Um, they want to make sure that uh, that the authorising officer key contact are based in the UK, and I think they've used the national insurance number uh, to, to, to do that. And uh, the company's house reference number will be to... Um, uh, make sure that they're looking at the right company when carrying out uh, checks uh, on sponsors to make sure that things that have that should have been reported have been reported. Um, again, not something I think would be likely to affect uh, the sector very much, but you are still being asked to provide that information if you haven't done so uh, already. So just finally, no, no, I've got a couple of slides on, on, on students, but just uh, wanted to put a quick poll up, see how things went uh, over the student surge uh, period over the summer. Uh, how many has you assigned this year compared with 2022? Sort of a range of options to try and get a feel for whether it's sort of more or less in line with expectations or not. So, um, uh, so as I say, various options, fewer either in line with expectations or an unexpected uh, reduction in the number of uh, CASs assigned. Um, similar number uh, to last year, and that's what you're expecting, uh, or a similar number, but actually that's not what you're expecting. And then you've assigned more. You've made uh, your um, finance teams very happy by assigning more CAS, and that was in line with your expectations or not in line with expectations. Thank you for that. I think that is being shared and everybody can see the results of that. Uh, uh, quite a few of you, well, we don't have a huge sample here, do we? So how scientific is this answer? Not very, but from our uh, results, see that a few of you not assigned as many cases you're expecting and that was unexpected, which is obviously a shame, um, but certainly in line with, the, with what we've been hearing. Um, Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you uh, for indulging me up there. Um, all right, I promise a couple of slides on, on, on agents and then uh, those of you from HR teams, I promise we'll get onto your stuff uh, very, very, very shortly. So um, this sort of really, I suppose, have a home message about making sure that the agents that you're working with are reputable, that you've done due diligence on them, uh, because this is clearly now an area that the Home Office are going to be looking at 
uh, in, in more detail. So you should have been providing details uh, of the agents that you work with, um, like the UKVI, um, and you know where, where there is an association with an agent who's been linked with abuse, then that can lead to compliance problems for you. Um, on the other side of that uh, equation is that you know where we are concerned about uh, visa refusals, non-genuine students. If we're working with trusted, reputable agents, uh, agents that we've been working with for many years, uh, understand the UK immigration system, understand your requirements, uh, that can really help in making sure that, that the overwhelming majority of our students are genuine um, and you know, I'm aware of some universities, for example, saying that in some higher risk countries, all students have to go through an agent who's been, been vetted and approved by the university in order to uh, re reduce those risks. So you know, there is a risk of working with agents, but at the same time, they can help reduce risk as well, where, where you're comfortable, where you have a good relationship with them. Um, uh, so make sure you've got due diligence uh, on, 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 uh, done on, on new agents. Make sure you have a formal agreement in place, um, not to get too salesy. Our commercial team have experience of work of, of you know, reviewing commercial of um, reviewing these agreements, and would be very happy to speak to you about that if it, it's up for a uh, up for a review. Um, and then once you've got a good agent in place, once you've got that relationship, you know, do make sure that you are monitoring them as well, looking at the uh, trends as far as approvals, dropouts. Uh, are, are concerned and you know where issues arise you know address them by the be that through training the agents um uh, if they if they need it or terminating the agreement where where, where you where you're really concerned um and something that you know we don't really see within the university sector because your sort of uh, admissions process are far more established and and uh, by, by by necessity uh, for, 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 for more, um Structured, uh, you know, it, it is is something actually we see when we work with independent schools. Is an agent, you know, making an approach at the very last minute, saying they have, you know, lots of uh, students. They're ready to get. They, they need places. We're ready to uh, apply for visas. We just need the CAS. Oh, let's forget about the deposit. Let's forget about uh, your your usual processes. Um, you know, never be never be blinded by. Uh, by the pound signs that those agents might be throwing away. But just to say that's not something we we normally see uh, within within higher education, more something in in, in um, uh, colleges and, and schools. And this is a slide. I, I if you attended one of these sessions in the past, you might recognise this slide. I, I have I have put it up before. It is something I just wanted to sort of flag because it it's sort of associated with. Uh, agents, uh, but it's also around uh, exploitation and, and concerns about students who, um, you know, might might become victims of exploitation. There was a story uh, around eighteen months ago, uh, or stories rather, unfortunately, uh, of um, uh, students falling victims of, of, of human traffickers being uh, essentially sort of conned uh, into uh, breaching their visa conditions and then uh, set to exploitative work practices while in the UK. And, um, you know, in your sort of pastoral roles, you should be thinking about uh, about whether there's a risk of this happening, whether there are any signs of this, of, of, uh, of your students becoming victims of this. And as I say on the slide, you know, poor, poor attendance or engagement may be an indicator of this. And it might be that this sort of thing happens in clusters so, um, uh, you know, if, if one student becomes a victim and you become aware of it, it's probably worth checking whether some of their friends or, or, or classmates haven't uh, also become uh, victims victims as well. Um, so, yeah, it, it, I suppose you just really think about whether your, your policies uh, around engagement, around welfare, around admissions do acknowledge that uh, you know, international students in particular can, can, can be uh, particularly uh, vulnerable. Okay, but I, I, I did think I'd spend longer on the uh, student side of things, uh, um, um, but we are now done with that HR people. Here we are. So this is uh, the sort of we've, we've already talked about uh, the restriction on switching provisions, but this is what those new provisions looked like. They were brought in uh, at the 
very last minute uh, back in July, took immediate effect. Um, and it is now only possible for uh, somebody with permission as a student to switch into the skilled worker category. Um, and as I said earlier, it does also apply to other work categories as well. And we've got equivalent uh, provisions in the immigration rules now across ancestry, across uh, uh, global talent, um, uh, around switching from a student. And you have to satisfy one of three conditions. The first is that you've completed the course. Uh, the second is you're studying with a, an HEI that has a track record of compliance on a full-time course at degree level or above. And the cause that you've been assigned by your new sponsor, by your, 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 your work sponsor, your school worker sponsor, has a start date that is not earlier than the course completion date. I suppose that allows just for uh, scenarios where either the uh, 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 hand in for a thesis or something like that has slipped, uh, or, or maybe in relation to the um, marking boycotts that have meant that some students have graduated later than others, so haven't technically completed their course, um, uh, but they've reached the course completion date uh, on on their CAS, uh, and then the course start the, the, the employment start date for the CAS is, uh, is 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 after that. They would be able to switch uh, into skilled worker, and the final condition is that one I mentioned earlier in relation to PhD students being able to switch after 24 months study um, uh, rather than having to wait until they've completed their course. So that's the mechanics, that's, that's sort of the technicalities of how that, um, uh, those switching provisions, provisions work. So do be familiar with those, particularly where you are uh, sponsoring, uh, sponsoring students, as I'm sure lots of you do quite, quite regularly. Um, other issues for HR teams uh, to consider. Uh, it's been around for a little while, but just I think it bears bears repeating. Uh, the requirement to report uh, delayed start dates has been changed. Um, where the start date on your certificate of sponsorship um, hasn't been amended by way of a sponsor note, um, and the uh, sponsored worker will be starting later than that start date or later than the date that the visa was issued or the visa was valid from, whichever is the later of those, uh, then uh, if it's less than 28 days after one of those dates, there's no requirement to report anything. If it's more than 28 days after one of those, the later of those dates, uh, it must be reported. And unless there is a good reason, then UKVI's guidance now is that they will curtail those uh, those those visas. So do keep an eye on things. And I suppose the key tip there is um, if somebody has delayed submitting their visa application uh, for whatever reason, uh, if you can get back into the system and add a sponsor note in order to uh, uh, correct the start dates, then that means you're not going to have a, uh, or you're less likely to have an issue in terms of the uh, final uh, the the um, uh, their, their, their delayed start and the need to report that. Something which I'm sure you're all uh, uh, completely on top of, don't have any concerns about, are those students or sponsored students with restrictions on their working hours uh, who are employed by the university uh, and making sure that they don't breach those conditions. Uh, I simply said on the side, just make sure they don't, uh, which I know is not a very straightforward uh, uh, question at all or, or issue at all, but um, do make sure you keep those processes under regular review. And if you do have concerns about them, uh, it is worth, worth, worth looking at. Um, something else which has come up, uh, I've spoken with a few universities about uh, our um, uh, uh, foreign nationals being sponsored under the skilled worker route uh, to work on a knowledge transfer partnership. So a partnership between the university and a, uh, a, a, a partner organisation in, in industry. Um, uh, uh, I've seen different ways in which universities approach this on the certificate of sponsorship. My, my view is that the better way to, to, to reflect this, because they're not working at the university's premises, um, is to ensure that uh, it's treated as a client contract. Uh, so you, you, you tick the client contract uh, option on the certificate of sponsorship and provide details of the contract between the university and uh, the uh, commercial partner. Um, and there is guidance in, in the uh, worker 
sponsor guidance about uh, migrants who are working on a contract basis, which you need to uh, adhere to. Principally, making sure that it's a fixed term contract or a, uh, a definable contract for a finite uh, piece of work uh, that necessitates a sponsored worker being based at the client's premises uh, in order to, to deliver that, to deliver on that, on that contract. Any questions about that, do 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 let me know because it's something we've looked at and have, ex have experience of. Um, uh, again, just sort of general points rather than a sort of a, a general, an overriding theme on this slide. Uh, do make sure you're internally auditing uh, the records and keeping in relation to sponsored workers. Use Appendix D of the sponsor guidance as your uh, starting point, as well as the um, reporting list of uh, uh, reporting duties. Uh, in uh, part three of the uh, sponsor guidance, so so internal audits always a very good idea. Um, another issue around uh, right to work checks that I've come up with when speaking with some universities is if uh, you're using uh, an identity service provider, and I know a lot of uh, universities are now certainly certainly the large universities, um, uh, is is how you do the imposter check. Uh, bit of that uh, check uh, of, of, of that of that process, it's not uh, entirely clear from the uh, guidance on right to work checks uh, um, precisely how we how we need to do that. M my view is that there needs to be some sort of um, uh, 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 live check, uh, and ideally with somebody who's got the report from the identity service provider in front of them. Um, uh, rather than, as I've seen at some places, uh, simply relying on the hiring manager to say, yeah, that looks like the person who I interviewed three weeks ago. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure that's quite as robust as it, as it, as it, as it, as it could be. And then the final point uh, is, uh, if you don't already, and I know lots of universities do, but uh, do, do have to think about whether uh, it's appropriate to have uh, a, a combined license covering both the student and the worker categories. Uh, they're both managed by you know, separate departments, separate teams within within the university. And um, you wouldn't want uh, breaches in one category to jeopardize the license as a whole rather than um, uh, 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 breaches by admissions, uh, jeopardizing your sponsored workers when you know you're entirely compliant with those duties or vice versa. Let's not uh, point fingers at any particular teams. All right. Uh, okay, just going to uh, uh, find a few slides, uh, talk a little bit about the uh, about ATAS, the Academic uh, Technology Approval Scheme, um, uh, because both uh, student, students, uh, sponsored students and uh, workers uh, may be required to obtain an ATAS um, certificate. I'm, I'm not going to go into, I'm sure you're all quite familiar with, with the uh, Broad, broad requirements. Just just a flag um, that if you're in the admissions uh, uh, in the admissions function um, and you are working with students who hold visas in other categories, um, you still do need to check whether they need an ATAS certificate. Um, they will be subject to what's referred to as the ATAS condition. Um, so it's not a requirement to uh, get an ATAS certificate before they get their visa, but if they want to engage in study uh, of a restricted nature um, after they've got their dependent visa or, 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 or what have you, then uh, it, it, it would be a requirement to, to, to get that before they commence their studies. So I think if you're not already, that should be something built into your uh, admissions processes. Um, and just in terms of the numbers, uh, since the broadening of the ATAS, uh, requirement uh, to include um, sponsored workers. We have seen quite a sharp, well, that's, that's fairly steady, isn't it? Actually, when you look at that, those numbers, there's a broad trend line. It's up, but uh, it's not, not suddenly skyrocketed, has it? But yes, there is a large, much there's more um, ATAS applications than there's ever been. And uh, as you might expect, the number of denials has also uh, increased, creeping above four uh, percent for the latest figures that we've got available. So those those for 2022. I'm interested to know: Have you ever successfully challenged an ATAS denial? Um, <clears throat> I'll 
tell you what I think at the moment, but I could have that poll uh, up on the screen. Thank you. Have you ever had later for denial? Yeah, we do all the time. Yep, yeah, done it a few times, just the once. Never test denial. So there we go. So look, look at this. Fifty three percent of you've never had a late test denial. Well, that's pretty pretty amazing. I mean, maybe actually your universities which don't offer those sorts of courses, in which case of course, you haven't had an A test tonight. Um, but somebody has challenged an A test. Oh, well, that's it. I'm very interested to hear that. Because uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's a box. You put in your A test application, something goes on inside the box. Nobody really knows what. And then out comes either an approval or denial. And uh, I suppose maybe if there's mistaken identity, they'd, they'd look at it again. But it seems to me quite tricky to get those overturned. Interesting. Thank you. Um, all right. And then just very finally, before we open up to some questions, um, just a few things that are on the horizon. So uh, another announcement that was made earlier this year was the increase of the uh, civil penalty amount for um, uh, employing illegal workers. It's going to triple from 20, up to £20,000 uh, per illegal worker to six up to sixty thousand pounds per illegal worker that we haven't got a date uh we're guessing it's going to be in the new year i've seen somebody suggesting january i don't know i haven't got any insider information on that um i also sort of i mean it's obviously a big amount um it could end up putting a lot more businesses out uh out of business it's probably not something you want to happen so again making sure you're doing your right to work checks uh properly uh, is the message there. Um, uh, the MAC very recently published its latest report and suggested slashing the shortage occupation list. So that might be something which comes depending on whether the Secretary of State decides to uh, listen to the MAC on this occasion. Um, and we are still, according to the Home Office, full steam ahead for uh, the switch to full digital immigration status by the end of uh, next year. So you'll all have been seeing BRPs with expiry dates uh, of 31st of December 2024. Um, uh, and uh, the plan is not to be uh, issuing any more BRPs. I think actually the date when they don't issue any more BRPs uh, is, 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 is timetable for early December. But uh, let's see how we go. We're moving to the electronic travel authority uh, rollout. Uh, so eventually everybody who comes to the UK who doesn't otherwise, otherwise have a visa will need an ETA. The rollout starts with um, Qatar from the 15th of November. Then the rest of the, um, what are they called, the GCC states um, uh, in February. And that's very much, they're very much being used as, as guinea pigs and uh, with, uh, and beyond that, uh, other countries will need to start to get ETAs, and soon everybody will need an ETA um, if they don't have another visa in order to come to the UK. And that is something which is, you know, is, is in order to support this switch to uh, full digital. Uh, because so much uh, IT resource at the Home Office is dedicated to the switch to full digital, uh, there are suggestions that the promised updates to the sponsor management system will slide yet again. Uh, so uh, please don't hold your breath uh, around that. Um, and uh, uh, the budget early in the year, the Chancellor said that they were going to be reviewing the permissible activities to uh, the uh, by, by business visitors to the UK. That's still ongoing. We, I was actually expecting it in the last statement of changes to the immigration rules, but there was there was nothing. So whether we get something more um, uh, later this this autumn or later this year, I don't know. Uh, but that's still ongoing. Um, we are aware that uh, the uh, visits team, the, the operations team at UKVI who deal with visits, are very keen to engage with stakeholders, and they struggle to identify stakeholders because visitors to the UK, for the most part, are individuals who want to come for a one-off reason um, to visit family or whatever but it, 
occurs to me that uh, universities uh, would have lots of people visiting and would therefore be seen as quite a good stakeholder group. So um, uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, not uh, very close with anybody at the University of the UK. Those of you who are, um, maybe if you're on the um, immigration compliance uh, network, uh, you, you might want to reach out to uh, operations at UKVI and ask if they can uh, contact you about uh, visitor engagement, because I'm sure they'll be delighted to hear from you. They were literally begging for uh, stakeholders uh, to uh, contact. So, uh, but that might already be happening. I'm just not aware of it. All right. Uh, a couple of quick things just to sort of plug. Um, for, firstly, uh, we offer uh, some e-learning, uh, which is aimed at HR. Uh, there's, uh, a, a, a module uh, in HR and employment law for line managers. Um, uh, normally, I wouldn't plug uh, uh, stuff that's offered by my colleagues in employment because they're my arch uh, enemies. Uh, but uh, there is a module in there on right to work checks. And if you can stomach uh, watching me uh, speak at you about right to work checks for uh, actually, they're quite snappy little video pieces, um, then uh, that might well be uh, of interest. So if that is something you're interested in, please do uh, click the poll to say that you're interested and somebody will be in touch. Oh, and you've already up. Yes, if you are keen, then yeah, absolutely. And uh, somebody will be in touch with you about that. Um, we're gonna have a few minutes for questions. I just have one more poll to pop on the screen. And that's just whether you'd like uh, me or, or one of my colleagues to contact you about any immigration support that you might need. Um, and, you know, as I said at the very beginning, we, we support uh, admissions, we support um, uh, uh, HR and, and sort of wider university uh, strategic teams um, with, 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 with immigration compliance, uh, visa applications and what have you, so a range of services uh, that, that we offer. Uh, including audits, for example. I mean, so even if you already have retained um, immigration advisors, maybe a third party conducting an audit uh, might, you know, might, might be something which you find find valuable. So if any of those things are in it, of it, that are on your screen are of interest, uh, then uh, do let us know via the poll and somebody will be in touch. And it's because that um, absolutely no obligation whatsoever. We just have a conversation and... Um, be happy to help you if that would be of use to you. Thank you. Four minutes of question. Actually, I should say I'm happy to sort of stick around if, if they keep on uh, coming in. Um, oh, and please, please do leave your feedback. No, but only if you're going to answer A, because otherwise I'll, I might. I have very low self esteem. Um, so while you're doing that, and I'm trying to ignore the results as they come in. Uh, just some questions that have come into the Q and A. Uh, actually, some came in a bit earlier, so uh, this might seem out of sync. But anyway, I'm trying to address some of your questions. If you switch from graduate to skilled worker, do we have to pay the immigration skills charge? I'm assuming it's only exempt when student is switching. Yeah, that's actually quite a common misconception, and that's partly to do with the wording that's on the uh, sponsor management system because it says um, uh, student. A tier four student uh, slash graduate switching. Uh, tier four, yeah, anyway, it suggests that graduate might be included, but it definitely isn't. So if, if you've got someone switching from the graduate route to skilled worker, they're switching immigration category and are liable for the uh, immigration skills charge, uh, unless they're otherwise exempt because they're doing a PhD, one of those PhD uh, occupation codes. Um, uh, so uh, I hope that uh, answers that question. And then uh, someone says, if you say that this ATAS is a bot, then why does it sometimes take three months? Uh, sorry, I didn't say bot, and maybe this is the sound issue. I, I, say, I think of it as a box. So in other words, it's a big mystery box with something inside that we don't really know what. It's definitely, the applications are definitely looked at by people. Um, uh, but uh, we don't know what they're looking at, what databases they're checking, uh, what their standards are. Um, just it's all a big mystery. So sorry, I 
I suspect uh, that might have been my microphone uh, or your ears, maybe. Uh, let's, uh, uh, let's leave it either way. Uh, and then actually, some questions that come in on the chat. Um, do you need ATAS under a global talent visa where work involves PhD level research under relevant CAH uh, codes? Uh, uh, my, my, my view on that is yes, um, having looked at it actually quite closely, uh, because we were asked that question previously um, by, 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 by a university client. Um, and the reason is because under the global talent visa, you are uh, subject to the ATAS condition. Um, which requires you to get an ATAS certificate before you commence on uh, either research or study, which is in a restricted area uh, at the uh, restricted level. So, uh, yes, uh, uh, I was asked whether global talent would be a way around uh, getting uh, an ATAS certificate, uh, to which my answer is no, no, it isn't. Uh, so, um, those are the questions which have come in so far. We do have. I mean, one minute, but as I say, I am happy to stick around for a little bit longer if there are other questions uh, which uh, people have. Um, but otherwise, uh, my details are on the slide. We will be share, following up and sharing uh, uh, the slides and a recording, uh, I think, in a few days, maybe next week. Um, uh, so uh, if there are any questions that occur to you uh, subsequently, having rewatched the session, Uh, uh, and help uh, as and when we can. Uh, so I think, oh, sound's gone again, I do apologise. Um, so I think that probably brings us to a close. If anybody, uh, say, it, it, I hope that's been of some assistance um, and we look forward to seeing you again uh, next time we run, run one of these webinars. Thank you.